Hi everybody and welcome to this video about the hemodynamics, the, the physical properties of blood flow uh, within the arteries uh, and within the veins leading to differences in whether or not atherosclerosis, heart disease develops in various different areas of the vascular tree or whether it doesn't. And also some implications of these theories, these ideas uh, about the hemodynamics of blood flow uh, with respect to the development uh, of atherosclerosis causes uh, versus, you know, mechanisms. Um, it seems very clear that there are a number of things that need to be in place before the disease atherosclerosis uh, will develop. And uh, that being the case, let's crack into a bit of a discussion uh, about what I was talking about in terms of these hemodynamics, in terms of these blood pressure and uh, shear stress factors uh, that uh, come into play. And we'll do that by way of a PowerPoint presentation. So we'll just switch across to that. So what are we looking at here? We are looking at uh, the basic sort of introductory slide, if you like, the standard uh, go-to slide that uh, we will always drag out for such things where we, we show on the left uh, a normal blood vessel with normal smooth walls and no uh, atherosclerotic plaques, no, no blockages there. Uh, Nice and healthy, nice and smooth, uh, no sign of fatty streaks, calcium deposits, atherosclerotic lesions of any kind, uh, pretty much uh, as designed by nature, pretty much as it should be. And then obviously on the right you see here is a uh, schematic, if you like, or a diagrammatic view of a blood vessel which has become partially blocked by an atherosclerotic plaque, which is shown here in yellow. Uh, just so that you can see it really. Um, it's pretty obvious what's going on there. The lumen size of that particular uh, artery has been, the diameter has been cut in half, which obviously reduces the volume uh, by a factor much more than half, uh, as you would understand if you can go through the circle geometry there. And uh, even a small change downward in the lumen size, the, the, the size of the hole in the middle of a vessel, uh, will effectively cause a much greater pressure drop on the far side of the air, uh, will much more um, effectively blockade the amount of blood flow that needs to go through there. Really not a good situation at all. Uh, this one here, uh, if it was as severe as shown, uh, would be a very serious situation for that individual. There would be uh, some very clear... Um, downstream effects on the tissues downstream of that point in that artery uh, in terms of depending where that is in the body that would determine what the what the specific health challenges would be uh, but yeah that would be a, a fairly advanced looking atherosclerotic lesion mm. so moving on from there we will go to a schematic look um, Thank you, the local motorcycle club, for deciding to do a cruise by this time. Nice of you. Very nice. Okay, so what we are looking at here is a schematic of the vascular tree. This shows both the high and low pressure side of the vascular tree, the vascular system. The high pressure side being the arterial side, the side where blood is supplied to the tissues from the left ventricle of the heart. Uh, through the system of gas exchange vessels, the capillaries, uh, at various different uh, pools, if you like, which are shown here as, as separate uh, pools of, of capillaries. Uh, for example, in the upper body, the hepatic uh, or, or liver circulation, uh, the stomach and intestines, um, kidneys. It's actually surprising to most people to learn that every time your heart beats, fully 25% of the blood that's ejected goes through the kidneys every single time. 
Uh, so the blood flow, flow through there is is very uh, very high level, and then you've got your lower body uh, capillaries there as well. And obviously there is a there is a series of capillaries uh, in the lungs as well involved in gas exchange. Uh, they're shown at the very top of the diagram there. Uh, and then obviously on the left hand side in the blue, you've got the low pressure or the venous side of the vascular tree. Uh, really that's concerned with the collection and return of the deoxygenated blood uh, back to the heart where it can then go via the right uh, ventricle to the lungs for reoxygenation. And then obviously the blood is returned to the left ventricle for another circuit around. So that's pretty much how that all works. Uh, the first comment to make, which I, uh, I made the other day in the live chat, is that atherosclerosis heart disease occurs entirely on the right hand side of this diagram. Okay, there is no atherosclerosis, there is no heart disease, there is no. Um, you know, cardiovascular disease, really heart and 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 the vessels. So there's no vascular disease uh, on the left hand side of this diagram in the veins at all. It's all on the right hand side in the red. So that's the first argument that we need to understand, which absolutely uncouples the causality of atherosclerosis heart disease from LDL cholesterol. Now, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because it's the same blood. It goes out of the heart, it goes through the arteries, it then goes through the capillaries where it's deoxygenated and, and nutrients and things are removed from it, and then it returns back to the heart through the right hand, the left hand side of this diagram in blue. It's the same blood with the same cholesterol in it. Okay. Um, if cholesterol were the cause of heart disease, we would find heart disease on both sides of the vascular tree. We don't. That tells us that it cannot possibly be a causal factor. It may well be a contributor still. We haven't eliminated the possibility that it is a contributor uh, via this logic alone. We'll do that later. Uh, however, via this logic alone, we can say it is not the cause and it's not the most important cause uh, without there being some difference between the vasculature on the right-hand side and the left-hand side uh, of this tree, that would uncouple that. Uh, that. It wouldn't make sense to say that the cause is LDL. Uh, the fact that we only get the atherosclerosis, the lesions on the right-hand side. There we go. That's the end of that argument right there, pretty much, in terms of whether LDL is a cause. So what is it that's different on the right-hand side to the left-hand side? Uh, in terms of the actual structure of the vessels themselves, there's not a lot different about the epithelial cells, those cells that are the very inside, those cells that contact the blood that flows through them, pretty much the same cells. Uh, they pretty much have the same sort of glycocalyx on them. Um, there's really no huge difference there. Uh, obviously, in the high-pressure side of the vasculature, there is a bit more smooth muscle which rings uh, these vessels and sort of holds them against the pulsatile pressure of blood being pumped through in a pulsatile fashion. Um, they're a bit thicker in terms of the, therefore, the overall wall structure. There's nothing there that would suggest in terms of the physical structure why the vessels on the right would be susceptible and the ones on the left not until you think about what I said before, which is the difference between the left and the right-hand side is pressure, okay, and shear stress. Um, pressure is the force exerted against the walls of the vasculature every time the heart pumps. Um, if you were to um, cut open the aorta of the heart in a, in a, in a live human um, obviously, you don't want to do that because you'll kill them. But if you did that, um, what you would get every time the heart beats is you'd get a spurt of blood that comes out something like six feet. So there is, there is, and that would be straight up in the air against gravity. Um, so there's quite a, quite a lot of force there. And obviously, that force is absorbed by the walls of the arteries every time the heart beats. Uh, that force is exerted uh, against 
those epithelial cells uh, and as such that can cause damage to those cells if the systemic blood pressure uh, is elevated, uh, which it can be for a number of reasons, uh, usually almost entirely caused by unnatural lifestyles, unnatural foods, um, unnatural ways of, of doing things, unnatural ways of being, um, which I'll talk about a little bit as we go along. Uh, so that's pressure. Basically, you've got a lot of pressure on the high pressure side of your vasculature. Uh, the ideal blood pressure is thought to be 120 millimeters of mercury over 80, and that's the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressures, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. Um, many, many people have blood pressures on the right-hand side of their vascular trees, uh, as shown on this diagram. Um, much, much higher than 180 over uh, over 60, much, much higher. Um, and as I say, that is a result of unnatural lifestyles, unnatural foods, unnatural practices, various different things. Uh, and that can lead to direct mechanical damage to the cells, inflammation of the cells, which line the arterial side of the vasculature. So to achieve a situation where atherosclerosis is going to develop, what we're already kind of alluding to here is a couple of things. First of all, we need there to be inflammation of the epithelial cells, of the epithelia, of that lining inside the arteries. Uh, one of the ways we can achieve that is we can have elevated blood pressure and that will exert physical force on those cells and damage them. There will be an inflammatory response uh, and that will precipitate the start of atherosclerosis. Um, why don't we get that on the other side of the vascular tree? Well, obviously, because there isn't that damage to those epithelial cells because the pressure over there is much, much lower. So there we go on that one. Um, moving along to the next slide, here is what I was referring to in terms of the systolic and diastolic pressures. What you've got at the very left-hand side of this graph is you've got the blood coming directly out of the heart into the aorta, and you'll see a pressure wave form there where it goes up there's a slight notch drops way down comes back up slight notch back down uh, and then you get into the elastic arteries which are the very biggest of the arteries in, in the system they will absorb a lot of that force a lot of that pulsatile force and you'll see as you go to the more muscular arteries that the uh, pulsatile, the pulsatility goes down and down, so we get more and more like a, a laminar flow. When we finally get to the smallest vessels on the arterial side, the arterioles, you've got a laminar flow that's not pulsatile. Uh, you'll see uh, movies where you can see someone's blood flowing, and you'll see the blood just flowing along steadily. It's not pulsatile in these in these very finest arteries. It just trucks along like cars on a road. Uh, and that's that's down in the arterioles. And then obviously you've got capillaries where gas exchange takes place. And then you've got the venules, medium and large veins, and the very largest of the veins on the other side, the vena cavi. And what you'll see obviously is the pressure goes down, down and down the further along this vascular tree you go. So there's the first uh, very clear indication as to why the damage is occurring on the left-hand side and not the right-hand side. Uh, as sh sorry, right hand side, the high pressure, the arterial side, and not the left hand side is shown uh, on this diagram. So damage on the right, not on the left. Um, in this diagram, we've got damage on the left, not on the right, as you as you read it. In other words, the the sides are transposed here. You've you've got the arterial side on the left of this diagram and the venous on the right. It, it, it's not like a side of your body thing, left and right side of your body. It's just like the side of the diagram sort of thing. You've got both arteries and veins uh, all over your body going all over the place. So don't think of it as, a, as an anatomical thing. Think of it as a diagrammatic thing where we're separating out the two sides, the two 
parts, if you like, of the vascular tree, the vascular system, the high pressure and the low pressure side. And the gray line through the middle there is the mean arterial pressure, uh, which goes drops as you go through the various step changes and sizes of the different arteries from the largest to the smallest. Um, that's basically how that all maps out. Uh, that's how it looks. Um, pretty much, yep, that's what we're looking at in terms of the differences between the pulsatility and pressure uh, on the, with the high pressure versus the low pressure side or the arterial versus the venous side of the vasculature. Um, what we're looking at here now is we're going to move on from the absolute pressure differences themselves uh, and we're going to move on now to a slightly different but actually very interconnected thematic and that is the thematic of turbulence within the flow within the arterial side of the system. Now on the venous side as I said the blood just flows along at a pretty steady rate it's pretty laminar in its flow. They're all pretty straight lines in terms of how the, the red blood cells will move through there, uh, how the fluid will move through those vessels. On the higher pressure side with the pulsatility, with the higher pressure, and with the design of the vascular system where you've got what we're looking at here is a Y-shaped bifurcation. A bifurcation is just a splitting in two. So you've got a large vein splitting into two smaller veins, one bigger than the other in this case. And the lines that you're seeing on this, or the arrows, if you like, that you're seeing on this particular chart show how the flow of red cells and, and the fluid through the vessels is pretty well straight lines until you have like a, a bifurcation like this. So where the blood comes into contact with the with the base of the Y inside the, 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 the splitting there, you've got this turbulence whereby the, the blood is pushed out and away from that splitting point, and it therefore sets up a, a swirling, a turbulence. And it's that turbulence which is the second thing that's required in order to initiate uh, atherosclerosis development within these vessels. Um, paradoxically, when the blood is flowing in a laminar fashion through these vessels, there is what is a very high amount of what's called shear stress. So you've got the pressure pushing outwards, that's the absolute pressure, but shear stress is more the movement of fluid along the length rather than pushing outwards, it's moving along the length of the arteries. And high shear stress is associated with areas in the vascular tree where there is no atherosclerosis or very little atherosclerosis. Uh, one of the things that determines an increased likelihood that atherosclerosis will develop in any given part of the vasculature is reduced shear stress. In other words, this turbulence, this mixing around, this sort of eddying and, and swirling of blood around these areas where there are bifurcations, for example, what you can see here is whether that, there's this red sort of areas shown on the walls of the, of the, of the vein, sorry, not a vein, the artery there. Um, you've got monocyte adhesion increased and you've got increased permeability of that vascular wall to LDL. So basically we've got damage through high blood pressure, we've got increased turbulence when the pressure is higher in fact, uh, and when you do have pressure uh, increased, turbulence increase, you therefore have reduced shear stress, which means this blood can actually linger uh, around certain areas and pull around certain areas of the wall of these arteries for a longer period of time, and it seems to be that which allows the adhesion and the sticking of the LDL molecules in between damaged gap junctions between two adjacent cells. The high pressure damages that, that junction between the cells, it forces a small gap in there. There's inflammatory markers which also further increase that um, permeability and it would seem that that's what allows these LDL um, packages to be jammed in there, the, the smaller ones, uh, not the bigger ones obviously, 
that's one of the ideas around the different uh, subfractions of LDL. There's a, a smaller, denser one, which is more problematic, uh, and there's a larger, fluffy one, which simply can't get into those gaps and isn't thought to be a problem for that reason. Uh, also, there's more uh, adhesion to the vascular epithelial cells, to the microcalices there, uh, of, the, of the smaller ones than there is of the bigger ones. Uh, they are more likely to be recognized as a problem. Uh, of course, they're not going to be recognized as a problem just by being stuck there, just by being jammed in there. Why are they sticking there? They're sticking there because those cells have been damaged. They need to repair themselves. And one of the most re important repair ingredients is molecular cholesterol uh, because 50% of every membrane of every cell in your body by weight is cholesterol. And if those cells are damaged, they need cholesterol to repair themselves. So, of course, damaged cells will grab cholesterol packages, stick them there. They're more likely to stick there, A, if there's damage due to this pressure, eddy whirling situation, um, and due to the, the, the overall blood pressure, um, pulsatile pressure pushing outwards. So, yep, of course, those damaged cells will grab that cholesterol and say, I need you, cholesterol, I need you to be here to do this job. Uh, in the normal course of events, uh, that situation would resolve, that LDL would then be released from that site and able to float away in the blood again to go back to the liver for regeneration. But because we are chronically inflamed, because we have chronically elevated blood pressure, because we eat the wrong foods that also cause us to become chronically inflamed, especially in our vascular epithelia, let, uh, just never resolved and these these LDL life drafts that have stuck to this tissue are never released. Uh, they can become damaged over time due to oxidation because of the blood the oxygenated blood flowing past them all the time. Another reason why it's more likely on the uh, arterial side and not the venous side uh, and also, uh, more likely to be damaged due to glycation, which is the damage caused by a reaction with, you guessed it, blood sugar. So obviously, if you're also living a lifestyle where you have elevated blood sugar, in other words, if you eat a lot of carbohydrates and have insulin resistance as a result of that, uh, you are in a prime position, my friend, to have inflamed uh, epithelial cells. You're in a prime position to be grabbing those a lipoprotein lifeboats and then sticking there and never being released, uh, thereby they'll become damaged by the oxygen flowing past them and also the sugar flowing past them all the time. As soon as they have been damaged in terms of glycation or indeed oxidation, then the body will say, oh, um, this ApoB protein is not the one I generated, this is not a native protein, this is now recognized as an invading pathogen potentially, Whoops, uh, we have an inflammatory response, we have uh, macrophages being attracted, we have foam cells being deposited, we have atherosclerosis developing. So that's basically the situation, that's why it develops. So to say LDL is the cause, I hope you can now see is absolutely, patently, fundamentally a ridiculous statement to make because A, your body will not react to native LDL as generated and synthesized by your body. It is a substance put there by your body for a purpose. It's there because it's supposed to be there. Um, why would your body react to it? Of course it won't. It doesn't. Uh, it's not a problem. It never was a problem. It never will be a problem. Your blood LDL readings are completely irrelevant to your risk of heart disease. What are the things that are relevant to your risk of heart disease? Well, from this talk, there are several things. Number one, if you eat a diet which is high in plant matter, you will be consuming a lot of things that are very likely to cause directly an inflammation, an immune kind of response in your vascular epithelial cells because plants contain a lot of chemicals which are there uh, in order to basically discourage you animal from eating that plant. Uh, the plant can't run away from you like another animal can. Uh, it doesn't have venom in the same way that other some other animals do. Uh, it has a venom by way of discouraging you from eating it, and it will do that uh, chemically, and it will do that by causing inflammation, by making you sick. Uh, and that's what it does. Um, also, 
plants are usually pretty high in carbohydrates, um, starches, sugars as well. Starch and sugar obviously will cause insulin resistance over time, especially if you mix them up with fats. Uh, have a look at my video on the Randall cycle if you want to understand why that's the case. Uh, yep, so you've got that mixing of, of factors there. Uh, if you've got elevated blood pressure, which you will have, um, if you're carrying a bit of extra weight around, if you've got insulin resistance, if you're chronically inflamed, because your blood will also be thicker, it will be it will contain a lot of fibrin. Um, if you're not uh, earthing yourself, uh, grounding yourself electrically to the earth uh, for a significant number of hours every day, same thing, you'll have a lot of fibre and you'll have thicker blood, your heart will have to pump harder to get it around. That's an unnatural way of being, an unnatural way of living. We're not supposed to be electrically insulated from the earth, we're supposed to be connected to it. Um, yeah, so that's, they, these are all factors that, that are leading to this situation. Uh, and then what you're going to get is you're going to get development of atherosclerosis if you're inflamed, if you have high blood pressure, if you have thick blood. Uh, if you eat a lot of plants, if you're not uh, earthing yourself, yep, they're all things that will lead to your likelihood of developing atherosclerosis. And it will develop at the points where you have low shear stress because of turbulent flow in the larger arteries, not in the smaller arteries and not in the veins. So that's basically how that develops. You'll find the same thing um around the curve of your main aorta that comes out of the top of your heart. I'll show you a slide on that in a minute. Uh, but basically what you've got is if you've got a, a tube that's curving around in an inverted U shape, uh, like so, then obviously the blood traveling around the top of that arch is traveling faster. The shear stress against that wall is higher than on the inside. That blood is traveling slower. Um, so there's kind of little eddies, there's kind of a bit of turbulence, but also that blood is traveling slower to get around the curve. Uh, and so obviously the atherosclerosis will develop on the underside of the aortic arch rather than on the top. Um, it all follows, it's all part of the same uh, model. Here we see uh, another look at the bifurcation there with the different arrows showing the different uh, disturbances in blood flow. The areas in green there are the areas where atherosclerosis is, is more likely to develop because of the turbulence. Um, the red area there is the one where the atherosclerosis is less likely to be. Uh, and then on the right, you can see that borne out with the areas of atherosclerosis developing exactly around these areas where the turbulence and the shear stress is reduced. That would seem to back up this concept pretty firmly, I would say. Converging lines of evidence, high level studies is what we've got here. Um, basically, we've got simple, common sense, mechanistic, hey, look, here's a theory about how this works, and here it is in practice. We can see it right here, mechanistically, boof, okay? Other areas, same blood, same cholesterol in it, same amount of oxygen in it, same amount of glucose in it, no atherosclerosis. There must be a mechanical situation going on here, and here it is, end of discussion, right? End of argument, um, there it is, right here in, I was going to say black and white, but it's actually green and red and black and white and yellow. So, there you go. Uh, there it is there. You'll see a very little bit of atherosclerosis that's developed around that uh, bifurcation point, around around areas sort of uh, four, sorry, five, six, and seven there on this, on this diagram. And... A little bit will develop there once the atherosclerosis has already developed in areas um, two and four mostly. The reason being obviously that that will then change the flow dynamics and push blood back against uh, that bifurcation point where it normally would diverge away. It gets thrown back in there so you've got a lot of turbulence, reduced shear stress, whoops, it starts to develop as a secondary plaque once the original plaques in areas two and four are already uh, highly advanced. So that's uh, that's an explanation on that one for you in terms of the mechanics. So pretty much here we have a look now at a schematic of just the high pressure side of the vasculature and in this case we're only talking about the very largest of arteries. The reason being is that there just isn't atherosclerosis developing in the smaller ones. 
Why is that? Because the smaller the vessels for the same driving pressure of the heart pumping, the greater the pressure drop uh, is in those vessels. Uh, it gets to a point very quickly uh, in the anything other than the very largest of the arteries where the pressure simply isn't high enough to damage those epithelial cells sufficiently to allow the process to develop. So it just doesn't, um, pretty much. So here we see a schematic here. The areas in red are the areas where there's not much atherosclerosis or any at all. And the areas shown in yellow are the areas where you're going to find the atherosclerosis. And what you can see, obviously, is that they are all the areas where the shear stress, the rate at which blood flows across those tissues is reduced. And the areas where it doesn't develop are the areas uh, where the shear stress is highest. So pretty much, and there you go in a nutshell, that's the discussion on the mechanical hemodynamic side of how it is atherosclerosis develops, what causes it, what doesn't cause it, and what doesn't cause it obviously is LDL cholesterol. We've, we've shown that very, very clearly. We've shown it logically. We've shown it mechanistically. We can now absolutely dismiss the idea for all time that LDL cholesterol is an important causal factor in atherosclerosis. It simply isn't. Uh, it contributes, but it only contributes loosely in that once LDL becomes bound up and uh, jammed into these areas, then it can become deranged by glycative and by oxidative damage. Then the body can respond to it. Uh, as an invading pathogen or potential invading pathogen. Thus, we can get the situation of atherosclerosis. It is an unnatural disease process. It does occur due to unnatural lifestyles, unnatural diets, uh, insulation of the individual um, electrically from the earth, inflammatory foodstuffs such as plant matter, such as things that are high in glycemic load, uh, such as things that are high in sugars, uh, so uh, starchy vegetables, fruits, those kind of things. Uh, also, foods that are high in deuterium, again, uh, fruits and starchy vegetables mostly. Um, yeah, pretty much insulin resistance, high blood pressure, reduced shear stress in areas of the vascular tree where turbulence has an effect. It all adds up to a picture of a pretty clear mechanical set of circumstances whereby atherosclerosis can develop and what needs to be done to reduce one's risk of developing it. And that would be simple. One, don't consume starchy foods. Two, don't consume sugary foods, and that includes fruit. Three, uh, don't consume plants pretty much because of the um, substances that they contain, which are going to cause immune responses. Um, don't avoid saturated fats, uh, reason being because if you do that, that probably means you're promoting the intake of polyunsaturated fats. They're very unstable. They will cause inflammation in your epithelial cells. Uh, don't develop um, insulin resistance. The best way to do that, again, is to follow the steps I've already outlined pretty much. Um, don't keep yourself electrically insulated from the earth uh, 24 hours a day. Make sure you spend a significant amount of time connected to the earth in an electrical fashion. Um, what else can you do? Pretty much, uh, yep, uh, keep your blood pressure low, keep your stress low, uh, pretty much all the sorts of things uh, that will reduce your risk. Uh, what should you absolutely not do is worry about cholesterol, any reading of cholesterol in your blood at all, pretty much. Um, what should you not do? Intervene by taking dangerous contraindicated poison, because uh, and they won't actually impact on your heart disease uh, risk at all. Uh, for a discussion on that, a recent discussion on that, uh, do a search on Asim Melhotra who is a world-renowned cardiovascular surgeon um, who basically has come to the realization in recent years that the LDL hypothesis is nonsense. And he's done some analysis of the high-level epidemiological studies. And what he is able to show with his discussions, which I won't cover again here today because I can't do a better job than he already has, 
Um, so there you go. There's my take on that. I think that should help clarify the mechanical part of this this argument uh, to show why you, there's absolutely no way you can say LDL is a causal factor in heart disease atherosclerosis. It is your blood pressure. It is turbulence. It is reduced shear stress. It is to do with the design of the vascular tree, and it is to do with unnatural lifestyles, including diets, um, electrical insulation from the earth, stress. Um, another one I haven't mentioned is non-native EMF. For good discussions on that stuff, see Dr. Jack Cruz. He's a good man on that. Uh, and once you've done that, come back to me and say, now, what did Jack say? Because you'll probably need it translated into English for you. Just a little job for you there, Jack. You're a good man. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was worth uh, your time to sit through. I hope it clarifies the stuff I was alluding to in my chat with Frankie the other day. Please do feedback to me on how you feel about it, how you think this video went in terms of did it clarify things. Uh, is this the sort of thing you want more of? Uh, yep, yeah, just generally some feedback would be good is what I'm saying. If you think this is valuable, do tell everybody you know about it and get them to sign up as well because... This is how I'm going to be making a living. Mm. So thanks for your support. I do appreciate you. I hope you stick around. And uh, yeah, we'll see you around very, very soon. Cheers.